All right, so welcome to 20 by 20. Now, as part of TV3's 20th anniversary, we're speaking to 20 most eminent Ghanaians. And today, my guest is a former Minister of Education, former Minister of Information, and a former CEO of the Ghana Chamber of Mines, and a pastor, Reverend Dr. Joyce Ayi. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? The Lord is good to me. I, I'm, I'm well. I'm well, strong, you know, contented, joyful. I think life has a lot to give. Exactly. And I can I tell that the Lord has been good to you. If I could borrow the words of Bwatijan who says, what you see is what you get. Amen. Amen. But tell me, what's your assessment of the media over the last 20 years? I think the media has come a long way, though I must say we haven't quite matured as media. But we've come a long way. We've learned to see the importance of being the fourth realm of the estate, you know, and uh, technology has improved. So we have a lot of audiovisual, you know, uh, media landscape. And, and the, the latest technology of WhatsApp and YouTube and so on has, in a sense, enabled many people to get into the media space, but not always so maturely. Uh, but, you know, it's a work in progress. I, I think I prefer the plethora of media organizations to the time when it was so restricted that people were even afraid to say what was on their hearts. Okay, but why do you say we haven't matured? We haven't matured in the sense that uh, we don't seem to major on important issues. We seem to still love the trite, the, you know, how shall I put it? something that would cause people to, you know, either be overly entertained or, you know, um, sad or something. Somehow, we seem to think that because people like bad news, okay. people like exaggerated issues, that's what we will give them. I think maturity should let us know that we have a responsibility to give the kind of information that would actually, uh, you know, within church circles, we say will edify, mm. will make people better. You know, because in the final analysis, it is the people of the land who really determine issues of development, issues of uh, spiritual and uh, economic growth and so on and so forth. It is ordinary citizens who have been properly informed, who recognize that they can do something, they ought to do something to make a, a difference. Over the last 20 years, what's your assessment of the country's development? You know, I, I think that there's much more, you know, the potential that we have as a country is enormous. So when you see things from the perspective of our potential, then you would say that we still don't seem to grasp what we need to do, what we have to do, how we need to do it, and so on and so forth. You know, because when I say potential, I'm talking about all levels of development. Okay. If we take agriculture, I mean, we have such arable land. I mean, you know, we are blessed with land, even where it is dry, even in the north. There's so many things that grow there. And if we managed the rainfall pattern and added some, uh, you know, what do you call it? You do a dam and then you do uh, irrigation. irrigation. We would get so much from the grains. There are different kinds of grains. The other day I saw watermelon growing there. Amazing. And then goats, uh, you know, pumpkins, all those things. Sesame seeds, you won't believe. Really? Sesame seeds grow so well in a place like the north. And I'm talking only of the north. What about brown half for bread basket? 
What about Afram Plains bread basket? What about Ashanti region bread basket? What about uh, Greater Accra region vegetable baskets? Volta region bread basket. The yams that come from the Volta region, amazing. The cocoa that comes from there. You go to the Western region and then you think about our rivers and their potential to give us fish. You talk about our sea coast. So even if you take agriculture alone and you decided to major on agriculture, now, having said that, there are other, other things. Okay. We have minerals. It's not only gold, diamonds, uh, manganese, and so on. We have so many small, small minerals that lend themselves more easily to development. For example, the paint industry requires what you call um, shells, the shell yeah. banks. Okay. You know, shell banks. And you know, when we're growing up, something like adodi, was in plentiful supply and you know we throw them away and they fall they form banks and you can actually mine them you know kaolin that is also in in, in the paint industry as well as in the ceramic industry clay every part of ghana is blessed with clay and you know what you can use clay for you know so the thing is that we we really have not actually taken advantage of all the potential. Just curious, also because you've been Secretary of Education and yeah. Information before you've you know, worked up there. What's it? I mean, these are wonderful things that we could do. Why don't we do them? I think we have to admit that as a people, as Ghanaians, we've got our priorities wrong. As citizens, I'm talking citizens, you know, naturally it's from the citizens that you get the leaders also. But we, we have a certain um, entitlement mentality. We want things done for us. We don't recognize that we have responsibilities, that even if we want something done for us, we need to get involved in getting the thing done. You say the Ghanaian citizen normally sometimes gets his or her priority wrong. But what about our leaders, those who have put in authority? Yes, we There's should hold them more accountable. And we don't, because we're always looking for something from them. Because we're always looking for something from them, it makes it difficult to hold them accountable. Because uh, my son wants to go to <laughs> wants to go abroad mm -hmm. and I, I need uh, somebody, a minister, to, to, to make the way for me. Mm -hmm. You know, then after a while, I've compromised. So it's difficult and really we, 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 must, learn, we must learn that. We are always looking for our leaders to cut corners for us. To cut corners for us and for as long as you are beholding, we are beholding to them in one way or the other. It's going to be very difficult. We never see them as people we have given our authority to, to represent us, to serve us. We see them as bosses. Okay. And uh, since we started using Honorable to, it has made my first worse. So in, in effect, we are our own problem. I think we need to help each other. That, this is where I feel the media has a lot to do. For example, how many of our media uh, organizations explain now the role of the MP as against the role of the uh, district chief executive and the um, elected members of the district assembly. Now, from the way we want to do our governance, development is not from the MP. The MP is a legislator. He goes to make sure that the right laws are done. Of course, he has to lobby and make sure that when the cake is being shared, he's not forgotten, you know. But he doesn't lead development. Let's just look at one other area. Where, I mean, one of your areas. And I want us to look at education now. You are Secretary of Education. Let's look at when you were in school, at the time, you went through Ghana's educational system and do a comparison with what we have now. What's your assessment of it? You know, education always needs to be seen from 
the perspective of the dynamism of life. Although I do admit that there are some basic skills that we need to have. Literacy and numeracy. They underlie everything that we need to study. There are certain subjects that are also important. I mean, when I was growing up, geography was important. By the time I came to the university, it had metamorphosed into so many things. I mean, there were so many branches so of, of what could uh, cover geography. So it wasn't just learning maps okay. and places and uh, learning uh, the various climatic changes and so on and so forth. So uh, subjects are evolving. And what we need to do is to always raise teachers who understand the dynamism of education and who can pass all the information. I think many times we just think of the people who will go to school, you know, uh, but now things are changing. The teacher is important because it is the teacher who is going to give the information for the child to imbibe. What do you make of the free SHS policy? The free SHS? Yes. I think it is the development of human capital. You know, terminal education should be at an age where you can branch off and do se several things. Uh, when SHS seemed to be the terminal point, it was very difficult because by SHS, the oldest person, even the, the oldest, oldest, oldest person would not be 17. Many of them are 14, 13, 14, 15, you know. They must be guided into second cycle education. And this is where the uh, free SHS comes in, you know, that as a nation, you believe enough in your human capital to provide them the basics for them to be good citizens. I, that's how I see it. It's the growing of the human capital that is important. And other countries have done it, and they really have great human capital. You know, uh, people who are constructive thinkers, who, you know, think out of the box, people who are creative, and so on and so forth. Do you have any concerns with, with its implementation? Well, the thing is, now you're bringing a minimum of 90,000 more to what uh, your existing uh, infrastructure can take. So naturally, you will have to increase your infrastructure. You see, I am an incurable optimist. I see the positives in things, and I use my mind to think of how you can get it to be its ideal state. So now you have to think of more infrastructure, uh, people love boarding school. Yeah. People love boarding school. And I think that boarding schools are good because you, you learn a lot of socialization in boarding schools. You get to know people from different tribes and ethnic groups. It's wonderful. Your best friend will be from uh, an ethnic group you would never have had anything to do with if you hadn't gone to boarding school. You know, we eat the same place, we sleep in the same place, go to the same classroom. It's a major way of bonding as a nation. And so I believe that we should have more of that. But of course, it's very costly. It's very costly. And so by all means, you will still have to have some day schools. So what I would like to see is the expansion of the existing boarding schools and the increasing thought of expanding, not expanding, growing some more, even as we add a lot of day schools. Reverend Dr. Ayi, one of the things I want to find out from you, it's growing up. Growing up, very That's interesting. How it was growing up. Very interesting. Um, I grew up in a, a single parent home. My father died very early. I don't know why he did it, mm. but he did. You know, so you I grew up with my brother. I, I was seven. Wow. My older sister was nine. 
uh, was going to be nine. I was going to be seven. My older sister was going to be nine. My little brother was going to be three. Mm. You know, my mother was 31, not even 32 yet. Very young. Very, very, very young, you know. So my mother married again, had two other children. But we, you know, my stepfather was very polygamous. So uh, we grew up with my mother. And we lived in North Suntreso, which was one of the estates that were built for middle level uh, public servants and civil servants. One bedroom, one living room. You know, we, we did not space. How did you cope? <laughs> How did we cope? Good question. We, we slept my we slept in the sitting room. My mother, my mother slept in the bedroom, small bedroom. You know, we slept in the sitting room on mats. You know, and. If my mother got a visitor, then we, we each that the visitor would leave early so that we could sleep. Wow. But there was something very interesting in our home. My mother loved to read. So I started reading very, very, very early. My mother read everything. Everything from cowboy comics to uh, women's magazines to, you know, serious newspapers and so on. So she made us go to the library early. But, you know, these are some of the nice things. Uh, anyway, she made sure we never lacked in food. Okay. We never lacked in food. And uh, so we ate well. Went to school without shoes. Really? Yes. Went to school without shoes. And uh, it wasn't until Achimota school that I wore shoes all the time. My mother would buy you a, buy you a pair of shoes, but she said it was for church, you know. So you can wear, wear them to, to school. Don't worry, there were many more of us like that. No, no, we were well, 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 It's difficult to, yeah, it's difficult to see me like, yes, uh, yes I, mean, I know. The fact that you, I know. you grab not wearing shoes. <laughs> you know, so she'll buy you a pair of shoes and then put newspaper, she'll buy three sizes ahead because we grew uh, yeah, you know, fast. We grew. So she'll put some shoes in it and then the day you were going, if you were going to wear it for Sunday, then Friday, Saturday, you had to rehearse walking in these big shoes. You know, and then there was always a cane nearby if you walked like an idiot, you know, which you couldn't help doing because, you know, the shoes were heavy. Yeah, yeah and a few slaps here and there, but, you know, it was, it was fun. My sister uh, is uh, 18 months older than I, and it was somehow we grew up almost like twins. So at least between her and me, we always had things to talk about, you know. She went to a brie. A girl's school, I went to Achimota school, but believe me, we wrote letters to each other all the time. Wow. All the time. So every week you were expecting a letter from your sister or something like that. My mother also loved cinema. So when I was growing up, there wasn't any film, good film, that came that we didn't watch. Hmm. You know, so it was fun. Um, we were, I would say, uh, not deprived financially, but also not on the positive side of finance. How about salt and light? Salt and light came as a result of my own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I accepted Christ when I was in secondary school, but I backslided for many years. Oh, okay, what happened? Uh, I think I think I hadn't understood the power of God to transform. So I said, I thought sin was normal. You know, I mean, you're a human being, you're supposed to sin. That's what I thought. You know, so uh, in my, uh, yeah, about from about 20, 21 onwards, you know, I backslided. And then God was gracious and returned me to himself. And then I understood that many Christians are like me, even today, they love the Lord but they don't actually recognize or believe that there's power over sin, that there's power to do good, that indeed God has given us his righteousness. So salt and light is, let's say, my, my personal, I would put it that way, my personal response to what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, that we should go and make disciples of all nations. Okay. And he gave me the salt and light because salt is a very potent influence. Everywhere it goes, it changes places for the better. And as a Christian, with God living in me, 
by his spirit. I should be like that. Everywhere I go, I should change the place for the better. And light, you know, light illumines. It illuminates. It brings cheer. It brightens areas. So really, if I'm a Christian, wherever I find myself, light should just be all over the place and to destroy darkness. So this is why it's called salt and light. And we use, it's not a church. It's not even a fellowship. Because it's not a church, we don't get collections. God will provide. Thank you very much. God will use you to help. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless me to bless you. Yes. You're already blessed. Amen. <laughs> so let's look at some of the things that, you know, um, you know, when you're relaxed and some of the things that you do. Uh, do you like music? I do. I, I like classical music. I like hymns. And uh, I like beautiful high lives also. I don't like high lives with um, lyrics that, uh, you know, that, that attracts the atavistic senses, you know. You know, some music, even the bass in it, you, you feel it right inside of you. And it, it leads you to have all sorts of sensual feelings and so on. I avoid those. You know, but I like good, clean, high life. You know, I, I've never enjoyed reggae. Oh, why? I don't know. Many people like it. I've, I've never really, I haven't got into it. And then even when it comes to jazz, I'm the very conservative kind of jazz. You know, this fusion and infusion and disfusion and all those, I still haven't quite got it. I like the still straight forward uh, jazz. One of my favorite instruments is the alto saxophone. I really, really love it. And I love the trumpet. Don't worry, I don't play any of them. Oh, okay, I thought you played it. Oh, no. One of those. But I don't play talking any. about high life, what's yeah. your favorite high life to you? Do I even know anymore? Well, There's the so many high life, you know. Movies. Oh. Eh, CK Man. Do you remember it? I've heard it before. Uh -huh. I really, I mean, the guitar in it is so beautiful. So beautiful. He has a, a medley. Okay. A medley, a Sichi medley. Sichi man, I think that's the, uh, you know. And I have a friend called Obaya, so oh, when okay. I see her, I say, Obaya, I am a bonio. The next time I meet CK man, I'm going to ask him why he did that song. Because yeah. he's told me why he did Araba Lucy. Uh -huh. And why he did Roma Minzi Magro and all yes. that. Yes. And I like um, KJC. Oh, okay. Mm. I like KJC. He also okay. played good guitar, good guitar. You know, so I, you know. Reverend Dr. Joyce. I Man, say, Umo. <laughs> mm. It's been great. Do, do you still have it in your, in your collection? We do. The original? Yes. Um, I know that, uh, you know, uh, Paco Finyako has that. Yeah, that would be lovely. Yes, he said me can. But before we wrap it all up, what's your take on this whole debate about what the president has said concerning, <laughs> you know... Uh, yeah, personally. Yes. Personally. I don't see anything normal about homosexuality. I mean, frankly, when God created us and gave us cavities, he gave us cavities for different things. A woman's cavity in front of her is for the man's what hangs in front of him. The cavity behind us is for us to disgorge our waste material. I don't see how it will become a place where now the man will put his, you know what I mean. When it comes to women, what are you, your fingers? Or, you know? So I, I don't find it normal. And then as a Christian, I'm dead against it. Passionately against it. You see, the thing is, people say, oh, there's the feelings. I mean, some people feel like murdering others. Some people feel like stealing. They, 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 they have the sense, you know. But when, uh, when, when you have these feelings of stealing, it's called kleptomania. We're always trying to help the kleptomaniac to, you know, adjust to life and, and stop doing that. Why can't we help those who have these feelings? to adjust to normal life.
Mm. You know, I think that's what we need to do. What, what I love about Jesus is that he hates sin, but loves the sinner. Okay. And that's how I feel. You know, I feel that people need to be helped to, to, to get over some of these things that drive them. Okay. You know? Finally, what's your wish for TV3 as we mark 20 years and as we move forward? Yes. As TV3 moves forward, I would like uh, TV3 at the cutting edge of the media landscape doing things that really inform, educate, and entertain. And when it comes to that level of entertainment, don't just give us anything because that is what is the trend. Give us something that will entertain us, but also help us to grow and to develop. That's what I wish for you. Be at the cutting edge. Be seen as a station of choice. Reverend Dr. Joyce Ayi, thank you very much. Thank you very much. But just before I go, I see some, <laughs> I see some pictures. There's one on my right. Yes. I think I was about 17. Hold on a minute. Oh, so. I, I, I need our cameras to catch up. <laughs> There's one on my right. Yes. Um, tell me more about that. I was still in secondary school. Oh, okay. And I must have been in the sixth form. So I was over 17 or 18. Uh, because um, we had to wear cloth. In Achimota School, it's compulsory to wear cloth okay. on certain days, especially Sundays. And um, so my mother got this uh, old kente that, and, and I think I was in the sixth form. Maybe not, maybe I was in form five, because sixth form, I would probably have braided my hair. Oh, okay. That's when we could do it. So, and the funny thing is that it was with a cousin of mine. I think I gave it to a cousin of mine. Mm -hmm. So she found it in her things and, and, and gave it to me. And I, you know, enlarged it. That's a beautiful yeah. picture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I haven't changed that much, have I? Uh, you become prettier. Oh, why don't I see you every day? <laughs> <laughs> and the other pictures? Um, the the, the other pictures. At. This one... Uh, was taken, I think, uh, as part of some pictures that needed to be taken for a board I was serving on. And then it was used by CIBS, you know, uh, to framed and given to me at a forum. This one is when I was 70, this little one with the white top. Oh, okay. I was 70, and uh, that's what I wore. How about? This one. This I one. The I, can catch up. This one was on the premises of TV3 because it used to be a Ghana film. Yes. Yes. Corporation. Yeah. And there was a function there. Okay. And you know, so when I was the secretary for information, what were you doing? I was speaking uh, to a, a crowd. Oh. And again, somebody who used to work in the corporation took the picture. I used to sew my own clothes. So really? that, yes, that one was one of my creations. You know, I'll take a kente stole and turn it into a top. And then, yes, that's what I used to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank very, you. Very much. Thank you. All right, so that's all from us uh, today on 20 by 20 with Reverend Dr. Joyce Ai. My name is Winston. I'm on behalf of the team. Thank you very much for joining us. Do have a lovely day.